Welcome to the Real Python Podcast. This is episode 38. If you're coming to Python from a different language, you may not know about a useful tool for working with loops, Python's built-in enumerate function. This week on the show, David Amos is here, and he's brought another batch of PyCoders Weekly articles and projects. Along with the mentioned Real Python article covering the details of the enumerate function, we also talk about another article about constructing Python graphical user interface elements in PyCute. David shares a couple of resources for data scientists, including an article about skills not taught in data science boot camps and a project for creating synthetic data. We also cover several other articles and projects from the Python community, including an update about YouTube DL, hunting for malicious packages on PyPI, using Python's BISEC module, 73 examples to help you master F strings, and game programming in Jupyter Notebooks. This episode is brought to you in part by Scout APM. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without having to deal with the overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. All right, let's get started. The Real Python Podcast is a weekly conversation about using Python in the real world. My name is Christopher Bailey, your host. Each week, we feature interviews with experts in the community and discussions about the topics, articles, and courses found at realpython.com. After the podcast, join us and learn real-world Python skills with a community of experts at realpython.com. Hey, David. Welcome back. Hey, Chris. Good to be back. So I wanted to start off with a follow-up. Uh, this is actually going to seem a little while ago now, but we talked about YouTube DL, and I'm yeah. sure most people know that it was pulled off briefly from GitHub, and it was reinstated about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago now, depending on when this comes out. There's this really great Reddit thread that I think tells a story better than anything that we covered. It includes links that start with a letter, basically. F- actually, it starts out with showing you what were the types of things that the RAA was arguing was why the DMCA takedown should happen. And the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation, wrote this really elaborate letter that explains why it doesn't apply in this case. And they worked with GitHub, and GitHub now wrote also their own letter explaining what's going on. And I think they're both really good reads in this day and age of open source software and kind of understanding why all this sort of happened GitHub's now has this sort of new process in place, which I think is good. That's been now defined, and they have this developer-focused approach to the DMCA, and this whole letter explains what they were changing. And then the EFF letter really goes well into what happened there behind the scenes as far as the legal arguments, and it's really well written for somebody who's not a lawyer. (laughs) Anyway, I won't spend a ton of time on it, but I thought it was really kind of neat. And then... (laughs) I think it's GitHub also set up what's called the Developer Defense Fund, which is really cool. Yeah. Yeah, I had a feeling that the whole situation was going to get resolved somehow in YouTube TL's favor. But I didn't expect like all the other things that came out of that as well. So I thought that was those some cool developments yeah. in the world of open source. Yeah. Yeah. And we mentioned that there were some specific things that were in their tests. And right. they explained why they were, you know, arguing one way or the other, why they shouldn't be included. Anyway, they were removed. But if you're interested to see, like, what was included there, it's a good read to kind of not only see all the parties that are involved in what's at stake there, but also it's a nice result for open source. Right. And for people that want and need these tools for other uses than what people assume is this malicious intent, which isn't always what's happening there. So, yeah. Anyway, so what's what's your first story you got? The first one I got is a real Python article by Brian Weber, who I think we've featured on the show before. If not, then congrats, Brian, for your first uh, first feature. But I'm pretty sure, I, I can't remember. But his latest article is called Python Enumerate, Simplify Looping with Counters. And so this is, this is one of those things that I think is a beloved feature of Python that Python programmers really enjoy. It's one of these, you know, batteries included features that that you hear talked about. Yeah. Enumerate is a function that is, it's a built-in function to Python that you can use to loop over a 
some iterable, a list or a tuple or even a, a dictionary or just any anything that you can loop over while also looping over the indices or indexes that are associated with each item. If you need the index, which you don't often need it, but if you do, then this is a really handy way to to do that without having to keep track of an additional variable. If, if you're familiar with other languages, a lot of times you end up having to do is like initialize some index variable, i, call it i, equal to zero. And then at each step of the loop, you have to increment it to keep track of where you are with whatever you're iterating over. So enumerate gets rid of that for you and just pops off the index with the item at each step. So it saves you some work and it looks nice. The article dives into how it works. So it goes over how iterating with for loops works in Python as a quick refresher and then talks about using the enumerate function and how that works. But it dives into a couple of other things. So uh, you get some interesting examples in a section called practicing with Python enumerates. You just see like how this could be used in practice with different, a few different examples. It also takes a peek under the hood by giving kind of the Python equivalent of how you could write your own enumerate function if you wanted to. So you get to see like, how does enumerate actually work? Like what's going on on there? It's not exactly the way it works because enumerate being a built-in is not actually written in Python but you get you know some kind of equivalent there. So yeah, it just walks you through how Enumerate works, some really practical examples, and then a peek under the hood, and then a couple of more advanced items at the end for folks looking for a little bit more that they can do with it. Overall, just a, a great article. If you're not familiar with Enumerate, it's a great place to, to learn about it. Yeah, I think a lot of people coming over from something like JavaScript and using that for something like a for loop or what have you, it's a nice quick way to <laughs> switch over. Mm -hmm. I know that initially I was you know, coming from other languages and using these other techniques for looping. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a great built-in thing. It's so much cleaner <laughs> yeah, and understands what you're iterating through, which is really slick. And, and the count is a very helpful thing that is often needed as an index. It's a nice tool. Absolutely. So my first one is going back a little bit into a topic we covered a handful of times, but last time that you were on with me, we talked about not having code running <laughs> during import. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> this is kind of related to that. It's called Hunting for Malicious Packages on PyPI. It's by Jordan Wright, who's a security researcher and open source developer. And he went through <laughs> and installed every package on PyPI to look for malicious content because that's always been a bit of a worry. And we've discussed that idea that is there malware out there? Is there mm -hmm. uh, sort of name squatting and sort of pollution there that could happen that if you slightly misspell something, could you be downloading a package that potentially could be malicious and have odd code in it? And it talks about being a security researcher and what would be involved in doing this whole project. And it's pretty elaborate. Things that he goes into, it definitely starts by talking about what are the things that run in the setup.py file that's part of setting up a package and getting it all running there. It goes into like trying to find these malicious libraries and that dives right into this idea of one of the more malicious things that could happen is a system call where a program is talking to your system and saying, create this file or uh, copy this resource or go to this go to this URL or what have you. And what's interesting about that is those system calls can be tracked. There's this tracing that you can do to look at that. And he uses a thing called sysdig, S-Y-S-D-I-G. By using that, he created this elaborate setup. Basically, one of the first things he needed to do was like, okay, create a script to get all of the Python packages. And luckily, PyPI has a fairly simple API, he explains in the article. And, you know, pretty quickly, he had links to 268,000 odd packages. And it doesn't go back in time. So these are like current listings. He didn't want to delve into that project of looking at older versions of packages, which I can understand that could get even exponentially larger. Yeah. So the process involves a lot of AWS overhead. He created 15 Elastic Compute two instances, these EC2 instances, yeah. about 15 of them. And then he needed this large S3 set of buckets to dump everything into. So step one is that this sysdig 
is started and then records all the system calls that are going to be made inside of a Docker container. And so the Docker container is set up and that's where it is doing the pip install of each one of these individual packages. And then meanwhile, there's a TCP dump container that's kind of the side of that that's created to monitor the network traffic going on in and out of that and ignoring specifically traffic to and from PyPI. If this package is calling for additional packages or what have you, that traffic's ignored. But if it's going to some other odd third-party things, that's stuff that he wants to know about and track. So then a container is created that just as it installs those packages, like I said, the sysdig is looking at that and then the TCP dump is happening. And so he created about a terabyte of data <laughs> that's dumped into this S3 bucket. And then he ended up merging that into like these JSON files. Okay, there's like a metadata and then outputs of DNS, a category for files, a category for connections, and a category for commands. And it was interesting the things that he found. Uh, I was expecting him to find more things, but he found two what looked like proof of concepts more than anything. <laughs> you should be aware of of what's happening here. And literally the first one's called I am malicious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I dash am dash malicious. <laughs> and it is in a way because it's going to create files on your system and it pulls them from a, a GitHub gist a Python file and adds this I am here message like I was here on your computer kind of thing where you're like, oh, okay, that's interesting. Yeah. And then the second one he found was you know another package literally called malicious package. <laughs> no spaces. <laughs> It was very similar. And then the one that he found that was like a more of an eyebrow raising, okay, what are they doing? It was called Easy IO CTL. And that one's, it's really hard to really tell what's going on. There's a Lambda function that yeah. uh, fetches. In this particular case, it, it's kind of hiding some of the activity that's doing in system wise. And it looks kind of sketchy what it's trying to do. And so the idea is, I think, controlling and hiding what's being created or not being created, that alone raised his suspicions on it. But anyway, it's a really interesting article, but also it could be a project if you're interested into it. He has created a Lambda function that keeps looking at all the latest packages that come along. He's basically got it pointed at the PyPI RSS feed. So you could put basically anything new that's coming into PyPI through the same process. And if you want to analyze the data, the terabyte of <laughs> stuff that came through, um, he's got a link, links provided for that. And you can kind of learn more what's going on. But this is a really neat deep dive. And if you were going to analyze what is happening and where you should be looking and, and definitely system calls, it makes sense. And there's this great little cartoon that he shares that's part of it too that explains what system calls are. And yeah, it's just really well done. Yeah, it is It is a good article. And did you mention that it's not specific to PyPI? Oh, the, he's going to do the same thing for NPM. Yeah, yeah. You know, definitely this is the same kind of research that you'd want to do on any kind of package. Right, yeah. Type of site. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Package index, I don't know. Yeah, package <laughs> index, yeah, right. Yeah, go through and look through all those. Yeah, totally. Repository of packages. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, it definitely explains that idea of these are some funky things that can happen during setup pi. You're allowing it to run, in your case, often uninspected code by simply running pip. And install. Yeah. And that's just to kind of bring up, you know, there's been a movement away from setup pie in recent years. And that's one of the reasons you hear people talk about is there's this this code execution that takes place, you know, it can be executing anything. Yeah. <laughs> and if it has access to the whole system, it can really wreak some havoc if you get someone that really wants to do some damage in there. So we're starting to see more momentum behind like the pie project Tamil and these other concepts to get us away from the setup.py files. So it's, you know, there's still a lot of projects using it out there because that's just the way it was done for so long. So it, yeah. it's a kind of slow adoption, but but I see more and more that that happening. We'll be moving away. I, eventually, I could see a, a world where these kinds of issues are no no longer a problem, but it, it could be really far away. <laughs> it might, might take a little, <laughs> a little more. It might take some time. Yeah. yeah. Scout APM is application performance monitoring designed to help developers quickly find and fix performance issues without having to deal with the overhead of enterprise platform feature bloat. With a developer-centric UI and tracing logic that ties bottlenecks to source code, Scout helps you quickly pinpoint and resolve performance abnormalities like N plus one queries, memory bloat, and more. 
so you can spend less time debugging and more time building a great product. And with Scout's real-time alerting and weekly digest emails, you can rest easy knowing Scout's on watch to help you resolve performance issues before your customers ever see them. Give Scout APM a try today with a free 14-day trial and experience firsthand why developers worldwide call Scout their best friend. As an added bonus for Real Python podcast listeners, Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. Learn more at scoutapm.com slash realpython. So what do you got next? The next article I've got is another batteries included type thing here. It's about the bisect module. And this is actually, in, in a weird way, just one of my favorite modules in the standard library. Not because I use it a lot. I can only think of one instance where I had a real reason to use it in actual business code. Yeah. <laughs> it was, you know, actually necessary. But it is, it's just cool that it's in there and you can reach for it and use it when you need to without having to write any of this stuff from scratch. So what is bisect? If you have a, a list uh, or uh, something that's already sorted, so a list that you've already sorted in order, then y- how would you say search for something in that list? You can take into account that, oh, it's already sorted, so you can speed up your search. And then also things like, I want to insert something into, into the list, but I want to keep the, the sorted order. So I don't want to have to like insert it at the end and then resort everything. I just want to insert it where it's supposed to go to stay sorted. So this is what the bisect module is all about. It it gives you a binary search implementation, which is the bisect function, and also a special kind of insert called an insertion sort, which is in a function called insort. So kind of those two words squashed together. So this article, it comes from a blog by a guy named John Leckberg. And I, this is the first time we've talked about John's blog on this podcast, but it's not the first time we featured John in uh, PyCoders, which is where this this came from, this previous week's PyCoders. The thing I really like about John's blog is that he gives some really good examples of all sorts of different things. He, he seems to focus a lot on like data structures and algorithms, how you would implement different kinds of algorithms in pure Python, taking, say, like a, a brute force approach, and then how you can If you just think about it a little bit more and do something a little bit smarter, you can get some improvements. He looks at algorithmic analysis and talks about things like your big O notation and things like that. So if you're into algorithms and data structures, I highly recommend checking out John's blog. And the post that he's got for us uh, this week is called Using Python's Bisect Module. So it just gives a couple of examples of where you could use this. For example, and this example I think actually comes from the Python docs, if I'm not mistaken. But if you have, say, grades from a student, like a numerical grade, and you want to determine whether it's an A, B, C, D, or F based on some scale, then you can use the bisect function to help you do that. So it's a clever use of bisect to assign labels to values there. There's a couple other examples that he gives and discusses the big O notation for each of these. Yeah. It's just a great article. All of his blogs are very similar format. And I just think that it's a fantastic resource if you're really into things like algorithms. You got lots of good stuff. I posted a recent video course on uh, the Bisect module. It's uh, by Liam Pulsifer. And we featured some of his courses before in the spotlight here. It's uh, another resource you could use to learn a little bit more if you're into video courses also. Definitely. Yeah. So my next one is diving into a topic that we've talked off and on about <laughs> F-strings. And speaking of video courses, I have a video course on F-strings also. This one is by Miguel Brito, and we featured Magende's blog before. <laughs> and this one I'm not going to spend too much time on, but I just want to talk about it briefly. It's 73 examples to help you master Python F-strings. The idea is here are a whole bunch of uses for F-strings with examples, diving into all the different ways that you know, not only just showing the basic concepts of F strings, that, you know, which we've talked about, but the idea of what's a formatted string literal, the idea of replacement fields that are in it and being able to use your, you know, names of actual variables throughout, which is pretty slick. And the idea that you can kind of use it to also 
do basic formatting expressions as you're working. So the expression can be within the, the curly braces that are for the F string, which is pretty slick. So you can say, you know, like curly braces four plus two, and it would you know, just automatically execute that code as it went. And it dives pretty deep into things like if you're not aware that the dot format method and F strings share a lot of things like justification, you can left and right and center justify things, padding, right, doing formatting, ones that you may be familiar with as formatting F strings as a decimal. Again, these are values that, that you could be populating in your F strings. So you could see them as a decimal with how many places you want, uh, percentages, formatting dates, um, which is a really good deep dive in this article about that, um, escaping characters, things like thousand separators with commas or with spaces. And then using F-strings with dictionaries, which is a little funky. You need to understand what's going on there. And then F-strings can be in a multi-line format, what you need to pay attention to for that. And then if you're going to print objects inside of F-strings, what's involved. So it just kind of goes through all those different things. Again, it's 73 examples. Right, left, and center are all examples. So (laughs) as you go into it, it, it's not that long, but there's all code for every one of them. and, And it's good and very detailed. And again, it's a good way to brush up on um, formatting and F-strings if you had questions about, oh, how do I do dates again and things like that. Yeah, definitely. It's a good good resource just to keep bookmarked. And if you're working with F-strings, you just pull up and the table of contents, not including the conclusion, has 21 items and they're all like topics. Yeah. So you could just use that to just like, I need, I can't remember how to do this and just find it on here and click and, and there you go. So it's a great reference. Cool. So what do you got next? The next thing I've got is switching it up a little bit from things in the standard library to an article uh, by Nicole Janeway Bills called 10 Python Skills They Don't Teach in Boot Camp. The subtitle is Ascend to New Heights in Data Science and Machine Learning with this thrilling list of coding tips. And <laughs> when I first saw this, I was like, oh, this is going to be another kind of boring listicle of things that I already know, and just rehashing the same thing. But I was really pleasantly surprised to find that pretty much everything on the list here was something that either... Uh, there were a couple of things that I, I didn't know. So it was like, well, okay, that's that surprised me. And then stuff that I just also was like, yeah, that's actually something that you don't see until you kind of get out and you bang your head against a desk a few times, and, and then you find the right Stack Overflow answer or, yeah. or whatever. So it just ended up being, it was a really great list. So it's got 10 items and she counts down from 10 to 1. So I guess saving the best for last, you get that feel uh, from it. But it, it, I'll just go over a couple things that, that I'll go. Most of this has to do with pandas too, by the way. So a lot of it is, is pandas centric. But it talks about how to set data frame display options so you can control like how many columns and rows and how wide the column should be so that when you're working in like a Jupyter notebook, you can actually, you have some control over what the the output looks like, which is really handy because it, I went a really long time working with pandas and never even reali- realizing that you could do that. And when I found it, I was like, oh, that's nice. I can just copy and paste. There's some settings that I know I like into my notebook each time. And then bam, that looks a lot nicer than just the default uh, way. Yeah, the default is not not good. It's just, I guess, the way to say it. <laughs> I mean, it's not terrible, so, but yeah, it's not always yeah. useful. Yeah, like sometimes you're just not. like, so yeah, it's good to know how to change that stuff. It talks about how to display like the format of numbers so you can control the precision, you know, float formats and things like that, which can be uh, helpful as well. How to work with Excel workbooks and dealing with sheet names, which so if you're importing from Excel and you have a work work book with a bunch of different sheets, then it's handy sometimes to know which data frame belongs to which sheet when you're reading those in. And she gives uh, a really nice little like recipe for if you have, which I think is a common thing in a lot of businesses, you have a workbook where the sheets all have the same name, but to like a different year at the end. Yeah, And so he has, she has a little recipe where you basically just grab that year name or year from from the sheet and that becomes the name of your, not the data frame, but you can append that to it so that you see it by year, which is pretty nice. And another one that is super handy is if you've ever been doing exploratory data analysis and you read in, I don't know, a CSV file or an Excel file or something, and you just want to get a feel for the data, right. a lot of times what you'll do is use the head function uh, or method on the data frame. 
object df dot head and maybe look at the first five or ten rows, or maybe you'll do tail. Those are common. But the problem with that is it doesn't give you like a, a representative sample of what is actually in that. So you might actually be biasing yourself by just looking at, at that. Yeah. So there's actually a sample method where you can actually get a random sample of rows from the data frame and look at that and get a little bit less biased ac- uh, representation of, of the data that's in there. So that's really handy. I have an example of that. Yeah. When I was doing marketing work and very often the information that was coming in was based either you know on name or address or what have you. And always being at the front at the head or at the tail was not what I was ever looking for. <laughs> right, yeah. I really wanted to go across and see a variety. And so I learned that one pretty quickly. It's very useful when you have data that's already, if you will, sorted or what have you, that it, you know it's not going to be interesting at the front or the end. <laughs> so the sample is very useful. Yeah, exactly. So it's a really handy thing to to know. So she goes through a bunch of other things. She talks about, this is obviously geared towards folks who graduated from like a, a data science boot camp because one of the topics that she covers is how to create a package so that you can reuse code. And that is something I think a lot of people that end up in the data science space end up a lot, like repeating themselves a lot in copying and pasting code from one notebook into another to get similar functionality when, yeah, you could create a package and then just have it available in your yeah. virtual environment or whatever. So those kinds of things. And then the final one that she mentions and I thought was really cool because I somehow had never heard of this is a tool called NBLint, which runs, I don't know if it's Flake 8 or what exactly it is, but it lints your, the code in your notebook and to check everything for Pepe compliance. So there's this little uh, linter package for notebooks, which is pretty cool. So yeah, it was just chock full of stuff that, like I said, it's got kind of a sort of a clickbaity kind of title. And my expectations going into it were like, yeah, it's all it's just gonna be the same stuff. And then I was like, oh, no, this, this is all really good stuff. Yeah, lots of cool stuff to check out there. Yeah, that there's a whole set of NB packages that expand notebook functionality. I've definitely used a few of them to enhance how you're talking about Panda the data frames and layout stuff, I've, I've used a couple of different ones to make them look nicer or allow certain levels of scrolling and adjusting and sorting and things like that. And so there's lots of nice NB extensions. So I'm hoping that falls in there too, that you can just add it. But yeah, nice to be able to lint <laughs> inside there. Yeah. And check your code style. This week, I want to shine a spotlight on another real Python video course. It covers the topic we discussed this week and it's titled Formatting Python Strings. The course is based on a real Python article by John Sturtz, and in the course, instructor Liam Pulsiver takes you through the string.format method, along with formatting string literals, or f-strings, the three different component specs for formatting, and how to specify precision, alignment, fills, and more. I think it's a worthy investment of your time to learn how all those formatting techniques developed for the .format method also apply to f-strings and how you can use these techniques in your own code. And like most of the video courses on Real Python, the course is broken into easily consumable sections, includes code samples for the examples shown. It also has a new transcript and closed captions. Check out the video course. You can find a link in the show notes, or you can find it using the enhanced search tool on realpython.com. Great. My next one is another Real Python <laughs> article, and it's by Leo Donins. <laughs> This one, he's on a roll, diving pretty deep into PyQt, or PyQt, depending on how you want to say it. And PyQt is a GUI Python package, and it allows you to create pretty elaborate GUI applications across Windows, Mac, and Linux. And this one is specifically, it's titled Python and PyQt, creating menus, toolbars, and status bars. And so it's all about that. It's just really going to take you across everything you need to know to learn about creating the top you know, menus and the menu bars that you'd see at the top of the window on a Mac or at the top of the, the screen on a Mac on the top of the window on a Windows application, how to create the different types of toolbars. Not only that, but add the icons for the different tools if you'd like. And there's a whole elaborate thing of adding in the SVG layouts for those, creating actions. So as you click on these menu items and so forth, what code is that tied to? And that dives into this whole idea of something we mentioned briefly about signals and slots. We talked about in Python 3.9, there's this change to decorator syntax, Mm -hmm. which is connected to that in some ways. But the idea that 
all these different signals that you have, these in this case, like I want to open a file or I'm in the edit menu, I want to cut and copy and paste and those kinds of things need to be, they seem repetitive in some ways and then they kind of slot into these different actions inside of that framework. And it's really well done, like most of his articles. <laughs> and I had a really interesting thing happen. The article is done from a Windows-centric layout and I was doing kind of going through the code on a Mac. And there's a part where you define keyboard shortcuts. And as you're defining the keyboard shortcuts, he's having you, you know, type in what the code would be, which normally for creating a new file would be like control N or copying would be control C and so forth. And those are Windows commands, which I know on a Mac would be command. And so I I type them in as it is and run it. And what's interesting to me then in the pull-down menus, it shows the hint uh, next to new file and copy and paste and so forth. And it's actually showing the Mac-centric versions, even though that's not what I typed. It showed actually command C Mm. and command N. And I was like, oh, slick. What if I put actual command in there? (laughs) Because I think that's the right way to do it. Well, that didn't work at all. <laughs> so if I changed it to command, it actually should like a little square box. Like, I don't know what that's supposed to be. And right, so it, yeah. there's some kind of built-in sort of uh, translation layer, if you will, to make it cross-compatible. And so I thought that was very interesting. And That's cool. Yeah, I, I you know, learned a lot as I did that. But it goes all the way into everything you'd want to learn as far as menus and widgets, as far as toolbars are concerned, and then status bars and help tips and all the kinds of things that I don't know. I I think of it as Chrome. All these things that kind of make an application a little more interactive in menus and things that you'd need definitely for a graphical user interface. And so what's really cool is then another tutorial just came out, which is called PyQt Layouts. And this one is create professional looking GUI applications. And so this one, another Lay It On Us article here is all about layouts. So layouts are then inside your windows, your, do you want it to be laid out in multiple columns? How do you want the different widgets centered or justified? Or do you want them to automatically stretch and adjust? And how about nesting things inside of other things? So dialogues, labels. Anyway, it's pretty elaborate what he's doing here. And if you, these don't necessarily create complete applications. They're more specifically about these sets of features in PyQt. And he has another article that's several months ago that's actually creating a calculator application. Mm -hmm. And that one's complete. And so if you want to like go from beginning to end and get an idea of a, a real taster of what you can create and see an end to the project, as opposed to learning all the fundamentals of these different areas, that might be more of interest. So I'll include links to all three of these things. And I know there's some more coming in the pipeline. I believe it's like going to be literally a whole uh, series, which is pretty cool. And yeah, GUIs is always one of these things that I heard talked about in my early days in learning Python as one of these like weak points. And I, I don't know, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. And I think it's, one of these things where if you can have someone show you what the possibilities are and demystify some of it, I think we talked about this briefly that a lot of people that are into Python or even we talked about data science just a second ago, they're not necessarily people that are coming from the user's perspective, like somebody else using this stuff right? and having to think about user design and user interface and the controls that need to be to make your application like usable. And so these articles really go into that more and can hopefully hold your hand a little bit and not have to make it so that you're diving deep into all the documentation yourself and trying to dive it out. So I, it's a great way to, if you're into maybe thinking about making GUI applications, I think both these articles will help you quite a bit. Yeah, definitely. That takes us to projects, right? It does. Yeah. Cool. What do you got for a project? So continuing with the little data science theme or data theme, I guess, that I started with the last article. (laughs) Sure. This project that came across this past week is really interesting. It's called Synthetic Data Vault. And there's a GitHub repo for it. And then also an article that I'm not sure if it's by one of the developers or not, actually. But the article is by Esmail Alizada. But it talks about the concept behind it. So it's a little bit different. So if you're familiar with projects like Faker, or I believe it's pronounced Mimesis, maybe Mimesis, I think it's Mimesis, but like Nemesis, but Mimesis. Yeah, okay. 
So it's about creating like fake data for you to use while you're testing an application. And because you might have an existing data set of, I don't know, say health data for people and you're building an application that does something with that data or you're testing maybe a model that you've developed against some of that data, but there's maybe like privacy issues with actually using that data in, in some kind of like testing environment or something where humans might be seeing it or people that shouldn't have access to it could have access to it. So one of the issues with that is, especially if you're like, say, working on a model, a data like, like a machine learning model or, or something like that, is you want to you want to test it on a data set that has similar statistical properties to the set that you are ultimately going to be running it. It should be characteristics that <laughs> look the same. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Otherwise, you don't you're you can't measure anything about your model on how it's going to perform on the actual data set that you're interested in. Tools like Faker can get you, you know, fake values and fake names and fake addresses and things like that. But maybe you're concerned about the distribution of zip codes and the addresses or something like that. It has to be some kind of some kind of distribution. And what you can do with this synthetic data vault is train a generator, like a data generator, on your actual data. Okay. And then have it generate fake data sets for you that preserve with some margin of error the the statistics that you're interested in. So it's really a cool, cool deal. So you're not so you're getting the fake data, but it has very similar qualities to the the data that you're actually interested in. Right. So yeah, just just a really cool cool project. It took several like masters and PhD theses to get <laughs> to the point of coming up with something and, and then eventually having this project. So there's uh, in the article, there's links to like all that stuff if you want to nerd out on the academic articles there. But, but you can also just jump straight in and GitHub and start working with it and generating your own fake data sets that match your real data sets. Very cool. That's nice. Yeah. I could have totally used this. I know. <laughs> I, was talking, yeah. I was talking about that marketing job and I created this really elaborate dashboard and I could never share it with anyone like what I created because it was it had real data that it was tied to. And so right. I and I, and it's it was really unique. It was like specific to all these, you know, branches of the bank across the entire, you know, state and obviously their name by region. And I had all these tools that it would cross filter all the data as you click on different elements inside the dashboard and it would filter it down, filter down. And I was like, oh, this is so slick. I really want to share this with other people outside the (laughs) firewall of the bank. And so I started to try to make my own fake data and names of regions and all this garbage. And it was so much work yeah. <laughs> to have to do that. And so having something, and I tried to use something like Faker and it, it kind of worked, but I really ended up having to massage the data even more than I wanted to. And so right. I think having something that it could learn from it, I definitely in, in, intrigued by this. And I, I just want to say, you know, you find the tool, you know, years after you've done the, <laughs> the project. So other people have been feeling the same pain, I guess. Yeah. I don't, this tool didn't exist years ago, so yeah, yeah, it wouldn't have even been an option, but, but yeah, I'm in the same boat. I could have used this in previous work that I've done. It would have been really (laughs) nice to have, have something. So yeah, it's, it's a really cool, really cool project. It's exciting. So my project, I got super excited. You shared this with me last week and I was like, <laughs> yeah, that would be for me. It had, it had your name written all over it. Yeah, yeah totally. It's called Jupilot is how we decided to pronounce it because it's based on Jupiter and it's a game programming in Jupiter notebooks, but it's not just game programming. And so the link I'll provide is takes you to the GitHub repository with it. And it has some really good documentation diving into it. But the idea is uh, it's a Python library that lets you create 2D and 3D games, graphics, music, sound synthesizer, and be able to work with all that interactively inside of a Jupyter Notebook, which is pretty cool. So they have three sort of (laughs) intended audiences. One would be computer scientists, researchers, and students of deep reinforcement learning, musicians who are interested in sound synthesis and live music coding. And I was able to play with that. I'll go into that a little bit deeper. And then kids and their parents interested in learning to program. And I was just talking to Kelly and Sean from Teaching Python, and they were talking about using CoLab. Oh, nice. Notebooks and so forth. And so uh, this is something I, I think I'd like to share with them to say, hey, this is another tool that might be useful that you can use and you know, get going and in, inside of and, and creating games in a notebook is 
pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. You know, the idea that it can interactively be throwing new commands in and, and running and changing things in, on the fly. That's definitely interactivity is one of the most powerful things about Jupyter Notebooks. The you know problems it has are definitely the state. You're not sure what state it's in and needing to restart sometimes and so forth. I played with the real-time music creation, obviously, I'm the sound geek here, and <laughs> <laughs> it was neat. And the synthesis stuff was pretty good. I was impressed. There's an organ that you're creating, and you're playing notes in real time, starting and stopping them, and there's like packages to do a lot more elaborate synthesis type of work in it. And that was very exciting. And definitely, you could do the real-time music generative kind of experience in it if you're interested and the only problem i had was i wanted to you know it, it said oh simply you know run this line of code and you'll your midi stuff will work and i i couldn't get that to go and <laughs> i think it's because my midi setup is way more elaborate than most people's i have these fancy audio interfaces and other tools on my different macs and so forth so i i would need to really strip down a machine and make it be simpler or what I was started to do is to dive deeper into the the code that's you know addressing which ports that it uses, mm -hmm. and so I thought about maybe shifting it to a simpler machine like a Raspberry Pi or something like that, and see if it could run on there, and and maybe then just plugging a simple USB MIDI controller and see if it would work, and then go from there. But anyway, so it's something I need to do a deeper dive and solve for that. Uh, but I was I'm impressed. You're just too fancy, Chris. Yeah, I, I am. <laughs> I, I have to admit, you could see the people could see behind me studio gear and crap that I have here. <laughs> so I shouldn't say crap, but it's it's definitely a lot of stuff. And I know how to configure it, but I haven't configured it as well. Though I, you know, I, going way back to my episode talking about async IO and music with with right lucas uh longa and that was really cool because i was able to run his code because i had the exact same synthesizers that he had <laughs> and yeah he uses it uses the same midi package under the hood but they've abstracted from that and have created their own layer on it and again simplified it so getting to where the ports are is a little harder to do and so anyway but it's a fun project and i like playing around games i like playing around the music and it was a neat kind of neat combination for me and so i'm definitely going to share it with lots of people who are interested in getting into that interactivity and playing around with a little more graphical content and sound content inside of notebooks yeah for sure i think i, I was just uh really i just thought it looked like it was just a lot of fun i didn't get a chance to actually try it out like you did but there's so many advantages of jupyter notebooks for something like teaching yeah and to throw in like the being able to do games and animation and sounds and everything makes the whole Jupyter Notebook even more compelling for, right. for something like that. But yeah, it's just, it's a really cool project. It's still pretty young. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's not even a year old. So I'm, you know, I'm just excited to see what happens with this in the future and, and where, where it goes. So I think there's a lot of fun applications for it out there. All right. Well, thanks for bringing all these articles again and sharing the projects. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for having me. All right. I'll talk to you soon. See you, Chris. Thanks again to Scout APM. And don't forget the added bonus for Real Python listeners. Scout APM will donate $5 to the open source project of your choice when you deploy. Learn more at scoutapm.com slash realpython. Thanks to David Amos again for joining me. And I want to thank you for listening to the Real Python podcast. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast in your favorite player. And if you like the show, leave us a five-star rating and a review. You can find show notes with links to all the topics we spoke about inside your podcast player or at realpython.com slash podcast. And while you're there, you can leave us a question or a topic idea. I've been your host, Christopher Bailey, and I look forward to talking to you soon.